problem before we we uh, broke on Friday? Anybody get a chance to look at that one? I think I left you with the answers. Hello? Did I? That was one where we had a, an I-beam that was supported in the middle against buckling at least in that direction, but it could have buckled in the other direction. So you had to test it in two directions with two different uh, possibilities. If you remember, it was uh, something like this. We, we uh, don't really expect to to uh, support a beam in that way, a, a column in that way. That's just a way for us to illustrate the fact that this point can go up and down, but just can't go side to side. So that's the only purpose of that. Uh, you're not really going to, to uh, build a deck in that way. However, as we'll see uh, in a few minutes, uh, that What's going on up there at the top and down there at the bottom greatly affects how much load a beam can support. So we had this problem where at midpoint the beam was supported against buckling in that direction, but it could buckle in full length perpendicular to the board and uh, gave you also uh, the I-beam in question, in fact I think it was just one right out of the book, but we had to use the uh, particular directions and the associated um, moment of inertia because uh, it affects how things are going to uh, play out. So. If we, if we look right down the y-axis, we see the, the web going as a hidden line that way. And if we look right down the length of the beam, we see those two supports that are drawn there in that way. So there were two possible failure modes. If it buckled, as uh, we could see from this plane, it might do so like that. If you remember, that's our second of the second of the critical um, modes of failure. This is an n equals two failure, where if it failed in the other direction, we have to come to the side and look at it that way. Uh, in that case, it's not supported in that direction, so its failure mode would be like that. And then that's an n equals 1 failure mode. So we, we uh, looked at some of this stuff on Friday. Uh, one thing you may not realize is that the length you use for testing this failure mode is this length here. You have to put in L over 2 um, in there because uh, then, it, then it becomes uh, appropriate for, for this uh, failure mode. Um, uh, well, let's see. Now, if you put N equals 2 in there, you can use just regular L. If you don't have the N in there, then you use L over 2. And that's going to give the same result either way. So watch for that. Yeah. Uh, the failure mode that turned out to be critical where did I write that down? Uh, one, uh, this, is the, this is the failure mode that is critical. Meaning that it's um, sturdier in the other direction because of the much greater I that's in there. All right, so anybody get a chance to work through that one? If you did, you'd find 
that the allowable load here, and that's after applying the factor of safety, which I believe was uh, 2.5 on this problem, you should get an allowable load of something like 393 kips. That's on the, the first failure mode being the critical one. The second one was not as likely because of the much greater uh, moment of inertia in that direction. All right, so take a look through that one if you still want to. Um, there are uh, consequences of different ways of supporting this, these beams. We have here the very simple, the simplest of all where the ends are pinned which means the beam is free, the, the column is free to buckle such that there is an angle at both ends. Generally, we take a, a, it to be a symmetric situation. And in that case, we use for the critical uh, length here just simply the uh, full length of the beam. There are other ways, other modes to uh, support these beams in that can improve things. For example, uh, let's see. For example, we can embed the beam at the bottom and use a pin support at the top. In that case, the failure mode might look something like this, where it'll have an angle possible at the top because of the pin support there, but because of the embedded support at the bottom, it's going to tend to uh, to be perpendicular to the wall at that place, just like uh, bending modes on a cantilever beam would be. In this case, use 0.7L because that's a sturdier, less likely failure mode. So the smaller L on the bottom means an allow a greater allowable load on the top. In fact, I think the book calls these uh, uh, an equivalent length, L sub E. So we developed the first one in, in class on Friday. And then these are these are just modifications to those possible loadings. Two others that are possible. It's possible that both ends have kind of a cantilever support to it. This one now, if it does buckle, will tend to do so with no angle at either end because of the uh, the embedded support. It could be something just as simple as a weld down at the bottom and just weld it to, to the wall or uh, however it's attached to the floor. This has an equivalent length of 0.5 L. And then the last of our possible failure modes is one that's embedded at the bottom but is not supported 
in any way at the top. So if there's some load applied to it now, it will tend to fail by just displacing itself. So it's not a very sturdy, uh, sturdy load, uh, sturdy column support. And in fact, it is half as strong as what we originally established on uh, on Friday. We put the uh, two and the L on here squared becomes four, so it's one fourth as sturdy as our simplest of modes that we started with on Friday. So we have those other possibilities. Um, this one's not pinned at the bottom because then if it displaced at the top there'd be nothing to hold it up at all. So that's not even a, a possible support mode. Okay, so let's test drive a, a couple of those possibilities. This one will look very much like a, an old, old statics problem. So a cantilever beam, well, not quite cantilevered beam, because it uh, is supported with a wire of some kind, but supported there such that it can't uh, can't deflect in any way at that that load point. So this distance will take as six feet. That dimension on the beam is three inches. It's cross section though, however, is uh, three by two. So we can see the, the three inch and then two inch depth there. And we looked at what that has to do with it a little bit uh, uh, yesterday. So. Uh, it'd be fairly obvious as we load this with some kind of uh, load on it that uh, it'll buckle, it'll tend to buckle where the beam deflects into or out of the board. Okay, and so we're looking, oh, we need a couple other things. Uh, the beam is eight feet long and made of 60-61-T6 aluminum. And we want to find the greatest possible weight that we can hang on there without any kind of buckling failure. However, also want to check it against uh, exceeding the stress limit, the, the normal stress limit. Because remember, this is going to be axially loaded, which was the, the type of thing we looked at in the first place uh, so many weeks ago now. There's your picture. Of course, what we need to find. Well, I hope you realize that this is uh, this is loaded just like a column would be, even though it's used as a uh, a beam. All we need to figure out is what is the critical load there that could cause buckling, based upon the pieces that we're given. So we'll divvy this up, just so we have a reference plane. 
if you remember, we had to look at the radius of gyration of those parts. It's just a different way to, to put the critical load equation. Where if we use the, the uh, radius of gyration, smaller of the radii of gyration for these two directions is going to be the one that's critical for that. So you need to look at both of these radii of gyration uh, to see whichever one is the smaller. That's the one that we use in here because that would make the critical load a lower limit. We want to design for the lower limit. So take a take a little bit of time and work through that one, realizing that uh, uh, this load here will be a function of W. And you can put that in there and then solve for uh, the critical load based upon uh, whatever the weight is. And that comes directly from a free body diagram of the very end of the beam. support conditions over the radius of gyration, which is uh, directly related to the uh, moment of inertia and the area, as in right here. Just like we were using uh, mass moments of inertia and mass radii of gyration in uh, dynamics, these are area moments. Tension must be the uh, vertical part and a horizontal component must be equal to our P there, and then that's the P we put in here. And then everything else will be known from the situation, and you can solve for uh, a uh, critical load, W. And you've got all the pieces, I think. Don't forget that this is uh, a cantilever support. So it's... Uh, uh, equivalent length is at 0.7. Because it's free uh, at one end, 
uh, pinned at one end and uh, freedom uh, un, uh, cantilevered at the other. Solve for this, it's the same as that, and then make those equivalent. And we know everything on this side, and you'll know this is a function of W, you can then solve for W. So you can use either one of those. You don't have to necessarily find the radius of gyration because these uh, two are equivalent. W, whatever W is, the force on the beam itself that we can treat as a column will be four thirds of that. And so now you put that up there. Everything's given except W.
되죠. 뭐이 yeah. well, don't want t I mean, you may need to find what we want is p. We need to know what the load is on this beam, the axial load on the beam that could cause buckling. And then uh, once you're all done, also double check it to make sure it's not subject to just simple compressive stress failure. cantilever support at one end is actually considered as an improvement in that it can increases the, the load. If this was a simple pinned end, then LE would just be the 8 feet, uh, the, the coefficient there would be 1, and it could hold less load in the can by uh, having a cantilever support at one end. Sorry? No, this is of the of the ones that pictured. This is the the second one. We're we're assuming this end isn't free. Uh, no, look at the top. See here, it's pinned at the top. That's the load that uh, the support that we're looking at. This it's cantilever to both ends. See how there's no angle under buckling? Here there's an angle, but none here. So the strongest of all is the one where there's no buckling at the wall, it's only in the center. Check some numbers as we're going along. I have a radius gyration of the two directions. Uh, that. Y. Yep, that's the right directions. you have something? Or are you stopped? Or are, you, uh, are, are the blues catching with everybody? <laughs> yeah, 30. 
360 kips. I have 32 for the load. The W kips. Kips. Philly, you have anything on that yet? Yeah, 30, 33 kips. What did I just say? 32. So you use the smaller radius of gyration? Yeah, because the smaller one on the bottom of the bottom is the same as it being on the top, which makes this number smaller, and you design for the smaller critical load. Because if you design for the greater critical load, then it'll fail at the smaller one. The book sometimes gives a factor of safety and it might say factor safely on Euler buckling. That means we expect it to fail in this buckling mode rather than the, uh, rather than just the compressive stress. We know P critical is going to be four thirds of W. That's just from a force balance on the end of the beam. Then you put that in here. <coughs> Everything over here is known. We know what the material is. We know the beam's area. We know the equivalent length. And R, you use the smaller one of these because then that. Um, get you to the earlier of the two critical limits. Sorry? <coughs> Where did that come from? It comes from uh, I equals R squared A. So there's the R squared, there's the A, and there's the I. If you, if you don't want to figure that, you're welcome to go back here, but you still need to use this lower of the moments of inertia. Either those two, these two forms here are equivalent with simply the algebraic substitution of radius of generation. why I should, but I'll also admit I haven't looked at it carefully as, as trying to calculate it myself. What they're doing on that, David, is they, we 
have our base that we established on Monday. Now if we cantilever one end and pin the other end, now the failure is something like that. And they're so saying that if we cut it off here, then this just looks like a smaller version of that. Yeah. And this is 0.7 uh, of that. Got it? Now, test it uh, against the uh, Impressive stress limit that's given because that's what you've got there is is uh, uh, designed based on buckling failure. It could be that this won't fail in buckling; it'll fail because of compression. It's unlikely uh, for these very long, slender type things. They're much more likely to buckle. But you have to double check that anyway. Phil, did you check that compressive limit? Now, now that we know what the possible load might be, four thirds, that will, you have it there, then over that area cannot exceed that given limit. That little y on there means yield, the yield stress. If 
was writing this book, I would have just put that in the first place. And it's easy to introduce when it comes along. It doesn't seem like any major change. So you should get a compressive stress of something like 7.1 KSI, which is well below the compressive stress limit. So your choice as a designer is to, could you just flip the, the beam, just turn it sideways and use it that way? Just turn it. Would that work? Just take this and say, oh, we'll just turn the beam 90 degrees. Then it'd be even more likely to fail because the weight of the beam would tend to automatically make it sag a little bit like that. It's going to sum anyway, but not as great in that orientation. So if you just flip the beam over 90 degrees, it's even more likely to buckle because now the, the weight is doing considerable more mending. Everybody about home on this one? Joe? Okay. design problem is a viewing platform of some kind with a column that you expect to build in like that. So we'll take this top, if it's just setting on that um, it's as if it's pinned there and in some kind of concrete footing down there. The details being that the column is three and a quarter meters outside diameter is a hundred millimeters. Factor of safety of three on buckling, which means we apply it there on the critical load rather than on the compressive limit. So uh, we have to check the stress, but It 
it's not expected to be trouble. And the material is 2014 T6 aluminum. And the expected load Each beam, each column is 100 kilometers. So we're going to design for that. I think, I think that's all the pieces you need. Different kind, though. Did a little looking around on eBay and came up with a whole new type of aluminum to use. Are these the cons or is this like a No, that's guardrail for the for the people so they don't fall off. <coughs> See, there's the mill. <coughs> up here. And there's the guy down here. Oh man, he's depressed. He's thinking of jumping. What's 3.25 meters, about 10 feet? tell you what you're supposed to find. I guess I will. Find the, uh, find the wall thickness of this round aluminum pipe. Shapes of columns um, can be important too if there's uh, fear of wind loads, which would be like uh, cause the type of bending we looked at a couple weeks ago, transverse loads uh, perpendicular to the axial length, which would contribute to the possibility of buckling failure. Chris, you realize that blue, blue 
boost for dimensions, reds for lows. But I don't know if you, if you were putting that together. You got grades for velocity too. Ceremony? Oh, yeah? Uh, um, my understanding is she schedules the presenters in the order in which they send in their information for the program. So evidently, it moved us very quick this year. Usually, it's very late. Yeah, last year, you guys went pretty late. Every other year I've gone is pretty late, and it's by the time you go through everybody else's exact same speech for the exact same person every time. Then uh, when we get up, the room's only quarter of the room is left. Okay. What are you stop looking at? All right, good start. <laughs> good start. We're given the load. PC. We're given the load, uh, but we're expecting it on a, on a, a factor safety on that, so you can put it in right there. Um, which means that uh, actually design for uh, 300 kilonewtons because that's going to reduce then the uh, other values put in. Um, so we've got so if you increase this, then. Uh, That'll increase I, and it's I that you're really designing for here. You got to shoot for a particular value of I. So if you don't design for the 100 kilonewtons, but the factor of safety of three designs for the 300 kilonewtons, then you'll have an I that's 300 times, I sorry, three times better than what you uh, needed for the expected load. So. And when we say the uh, factor safety on buckling, that means we put it in this equation rather than the compressive, ex compressive stress equation. So this then will give you an I, and I will be a function of the wall thickness. So then you can solve for wall thickness. Polar moment of inertia. 
theta, which was one half pi r to the fourth. You can do it that way, or you can put it in as as the uh, outer radius minus t to the fourth, and solve for the t. Either way, it's about six of one, half dozen of another. to be and then solve for t. Uh, either way, it's just a algebra after that because we've got all the points. Check it for compressive stresses, but it's uh, well inside of that. Check your units as you go. It'll tell you if your algebra is right.
in all the pieces. Solve for the minimum possible I. I don't think I have it as an intermediate number. Effective length is uh, 0.7 times the expected load, which means for the expected load it will be more than sufficient. And then that I is equal to this, and R0 you know, because the outside diameter is given. You guys, there's a slightly different uh, E in your book. You have E is 73.1, not 68. That'll change things a little bit, but. Three. Actually, would have made it more, even more conservative with the lower E. What is it, 73.9? 73.1. Like 
15 minutes ago while I'm still working on it. What is it? 7 millimeters. Are you guessing? 5.7 seven meters. Seven. Oh, 7 meters? Mm -hmm. 7 meter wall thickness? I got a good factor safety. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, uh, 5 .7. Does anybody have this intermediate I number? I don't have that written down. Seven millimeters. A little under? Yeah, that makes sense, I guess. Okay, looks like you. Okay, so that was 57. Subtract up to 30. Tom, you have to have this number just so I can write it down. 2.28 times 10 to the minus 6. 2.28 times 10 to the minus 6.
quadratic of a quadratic, or whatever you call it, fourth quartic. If you're not ready to buy one of these bikes yet. I think I can do that. So what? When I say, when it's to the point, I like to say hypercubed. <laughs> that's, that's to the fourth is hypercubed? Yes? What's cubed to the cube, though? Well, that depends on what a nine-dimensional cube would be it's called. Heavy. Hard to pick up. Probably be because uh, either it's not perfectly vertical when installed, or there's imperfections somewhere in the building of it itself. Uh, could be whether this is an extruded pipe, which they they push it out through a hole like they do noodles, or it could be a, a seamed pipe where they roll it and then weld it, which isn't common with aluminum. Common with aluminum is pretty commonly extruded. Uh, there's other factors to consider. Maybe uh, maybe something's not quite right there. Maybe that wasn't cut right at 45 degrees or there's a little gap there or something. So all of those kind of things factor in. But Chris, you got around 7 millimeters, a little bit less. You can solve it either way or do the top part. Yeah, I'd, I'd just put this whole thing equal to that number, and then that goes over, that goes over, then you unforth it, right. and then solve for T. All right. That, is, that takes us to the end. Good thing. <laughs> 